Yo, what's up guys? Raz here, owner of Razco. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about bear defense today. Uh, I teach some bear defense classes and with the number of bear attacks on the rise and the sheer number of people out in the woods nowadays, I just wanted to get a basic bear defense class out there for everybody to be able to utilize. So if you find some value in this, if you find some stuff that you didn't know, please share this with everybody that you know that uh, spend some time in bear country and hopefully we can save a life. So the first thing we want to talk about is avoiding bears. So how do we do that? Uh, a couple of ways. A, we want to keep a clean camp. And what that means is taking anything that has any sort of food or attractant smell, all your food, all your food wrappers, gum wrappers, uh, toothpaste, anything that might have an attractant smell to it, we want to put it in a bag and we want to move it away from our camp. Uh, the, the rule of thumb is 100 yards. Uh, that can be plus or minus depending on your terrain. You don't want to get it much closer than 75 or 50 yards. Uh, 100 yards or more is ideal, right? We want to try and have that downwind of our camp, uh, but as we know, the wind is always switching in the mountains. So what, the, what I'll tell people is um, the, the normal times that you're going to be getting to your food, so morning and evening, right? What, where's the wind going there? So we want to put our food downwind of our camp in those times, because that's going to be when we're going to our food, right? Um, so if we can, we want to get our food hung up high, you know, 10 feet up a tree, 10 feet out of limb. That's kind of the rule of thumb. That can be very difficult in areas. Um, there's a lot of resources on, on different ways to do that, you know, putting a pole between two trees or uh, different rigging methods. If you can't find a tree big enough to do that, um, if, if there's some cliffs in the area, you can hang your food off a cliff as long as it's tall enough to the bottom or something can't get it from the bottom. Um, it, and if you can't find any areas like that, just getting that food away from your camp so you have a warning that a bear is in the area and after the food is going to be key. So that distance is your time. And so, you know, getting your food away from your camp, hang it if you can, and keeping everything that might have an attractive smell out of your camp. Uh, that's going to be our main avoidan avoidance uh, as far as bears in camp go. Um, when we get an animal down, what we want to do is get all our meat processed in game bags and move that meat. Same thing, we want at least 100 yards away from our gut pile and our hide and, and carcass and all that. So, um, and we want to move that stuff upwind of, of, the, uh, of the carcass because bears are probably going to find that by smell. So if they are coming along and smell that and find that first, right, our meat's probably going to be good for a while and gives us a chance to get it out of the woods. Same thing with the meat. If we can hang it, we can hang it. Uh, if not, over a cliff works. If, if, if none of that's possible, you can uh, put it on the ground and um, hope for the best, really. Um, many times it's not possible, depending on where you hunt. So just do the best you can with that. Same thing, um, if you, same thing with your food. If you have it um, in an area where you can see it, as you approach, that's going to be ideal. And, it, and you want to approach that stuff from upwind so your scent is blowing down into it as you get there. Uh, stop before you get to it, look around, make sure there's no bear activity, no bears there. You know, you know it doesn't look like bears have been there and, and that sort of thing. So um, that is uh, avoidance of bears and uh, attracting bears. So um, another aspect of avoiding bears is not hanging out in bear likely areas, right? And th those might be um, downwind of a kill site, right? A natural kill site or a bear kill site or somebody else's kill, right? We don't want to hang out downwind of that because even if the bear's not on that kill, generally they'll hang out downwind and keep tabs on it. So we can run into bears in those areas. So if you're out in the woods and like you smell some rotten, rotten carcass or something, it's a good idea to get the heck out of there because it's very likely to uh, uh, another predators in that area. <coughs> In the fall, when the berries are ripe, um, that can be another area that the bears will be in. You know, thick, thick, ripe berry patches. They probably won't be in there any other time. Um, but when their berries are ripe, that's another area to avoid. Um, when we're hiking along and we are like going down the trail or something, we want to be looking out as far ahead as, as we can and, and just keeping our head up and scanning that uh, and, and not getting all, not getting, you know, dog down and, and sick of hiking and tired and just looking at our feet. We always want to be up and scanning the area ahead of us um, so that if we do see a bear, we have more time to uh, a change course or back out of there before they even know we're there or um, be aware that they are there if, if it is going to be an aggressive situation. 
All right, so next let's talk about if we are out hiking around and moving along and we see a bear. And this isn't close contact, you know, it's 25, 50, 75, 100 yards away. We'll start at 100, right? So we see a bear way out there, or we're just glassing and a bear's coming through. Uh, if we have the time and the space, right, that, that big chunk of space, and the bear doesn't know we're there, we don't need to let that bear know we're there either. Um, the caveat to that is maybe if your wind is going to be blowing into that bear, um, it might be a good idea to be ready to let the bear know it's there, let the bear know you're there, um, but you don't need to with that buffer of space, right? Um, so, it, you know, if you do spot a bear or it's moving through your area and, and it doesn't know you're there and it's probably not going to wind you, I would just sit tight, don't move, uh, and, you know, enjoy the show. Um, inside of that 100 yards, mm, probably 75 to 50 yard range, and it's likely that the bear is going to uh, come into your area or come towards you or wind you, I'm probably going to let the bear know I'm there at that point, right? And what that looks like is just standing up and calmly, confidently saying, hey, hey bear, I'm over here, and kind of wave your hand so he can see you, um, and let that bear know that you are in the area before it gets close and you surprise it, right? Um, depends, on, depends on the bear and where you are. That might make the bear curious, right? Uh, up in interior Alaska, where the, the game population or the game density is pretty low, uh, a bear spots a moving thing like a person, and it will probably come investigate that and see if it's at least worthy of, of uh, trying to make some food out of it. Probably not going to be interested in it once it realizes you're a person, but just know that they might, uh, they might come closer if you do let, you, let it know you're there. So um, inside of that 50 yard range, probably, uh, unless you're really sure that bear is not going to come your way or not going to wind you, I would probably let it know that you're there at that point. Same thing, non-aggressively, just, just let it know you're a person. Uh, you know, and we're going to start talking to the bear and let it know you are not aggressive. It, the, the bear cannot understand your words, but what that does is it gets your subconscious making your body language say that, right? So, and what we want to be is confident, but not confrontational. And we don't want to look weak and prayish. That might, it might initiate the prey drive, right? So, A, you know, hey, I'm just another thing and I'm not, I'm not going to bother you, uh, but I'm not to be messed with. That's kind of the vibe you're trying to put off, right? Um, so once it's in, you know, once it's in the less than 100 or, or less than 75, and um, the bear knows we're there, so then we're going to start looking for aggressive signs, right? And the bear's body language is going to tell you that, uh, and some of the noises is it might make. Um, what you're going to look for is, is very similar to an aggressive dog, right? Uh, what happens when a dog gets aggressive? The ears go back, it might, it might show its teeth a little bit, it might get stiff and hunch up a little bit, right? Or hunch down, I mean. Um, so a lot of the bear's behaviors when it's uh, showing aggression will be very similar to the dog. Um, some audio cues you might get is it might huff at you, right? A nice deep huff at you. It might kind of moan or, or like guttural growly kind of thing at you. Uh, it might pop its teeth at you. Um, and then a, kind of a, another visual sign is it might, it might kind of bounce or, or, or stomp its feet just to kind of show you that it's, you know, it's a big tough bear, right? Um, what really is not an aggressive sign, sometimes you'll see bears stand on their feet. And when they're doing that, they're either A, trying to get their nose up into the wind or stand up taller to see you over the brush and get a better view of you. It's not really an aggressive sign. It's more of a curious sign or, or it's just trying to figure out what you are, right? Um, once we start seeing those aggressive signs and we still have some space, right, we want to start de-escalating the situation. And, and like I said, that how we do that is, A, we show the bear that we're not aggressive, but we're not to be messed with, and then we can start backing out of that scenario nice and easy. We want to keep our eyes on the bear. Um, so that can, get, that can get a little tricky solo, but if you have two people, one person can and turn around and walk the path out and keep their hand on your back as you back up and keep an eye on the bear. If you're solo, you're just going to have to do the best you can, uh, you know, walking backwards and looking and just alternating views of where you're looking and, and, and uh, the bear. All right, so some of the uh, aggressive scenarios that we might run into are, there's, there's three or four of them. Um, the first one is, of course, sow and cubs, right? That's a pretty dangerous bear, especially if the um, cub gives a little warning ball 
um, or you know makes a makes a a little cry or something, um, the sow's going to be coming like a freight train, uh, I, and and she's not going to be a, a, a she's not going to fear anything at that point. Um, I was driving a big a big uh, mine truck up in Alaska, and I was driving along this road, and there's a guardrail, and I see this little cub pop up under the guardrail just as I'm driving by. It's a nice sunny day, so I got my window down, and I hear it. <laughs> And a freaking freight train explodes out of the brush right next to my face as I'm cruising by in this humongous truck, you know, a uh, hundred ton truck. And she didn't care, you know, she was coming to, to protect her cub. So a South Cubs can be an aggressive, dangerous situation. Um, a bear defending food is a super aggressive situation. Just last year uh, up here in Montana, we had a guy, um, just went out hiking after work to go fishing and happened to uh, stumble up upon a bear with a, with a moose carcass right off the trail and that guy got attacked. Um, he got out of there, but unfortunately he died a couple days later in the, in the hospital. Um, but really the, the point of the story is when they went back out to try and move that carcass off the trail and investigate and, and get the bear out of the area, they took a whole bunch of people and could not run that bear off that kill. So they ended up having to shoot that bear. So that just shows you the, the uh, level of aggression of a bear, especially coming out of the den in the spring and then right, pre, uh, right prior to going to the den in the fall. Um, bears are gonna be really aggressive defending their food in those two scenarios. Um, and it might be them claiming your kill as well. So uh, a bear defending its food source is gonna be pretty aggressive. Um, and then if you just get into a bear's personal space and just like people every bear has its own little bubble and you're not going to know about that you're not going to know the size of that until you get too close and it starts showing you those aggressive signs we were talking about um, predatory bear attacks are exceedingly rare and uh, generally they are not generally i would say probably half the time they end up being at night in a camp like an established camp in a, in one of the national parks or something like that where a bear is habituated to people's food they come around looking for food and then and then get curious about the tents and then uh, that can be a, a predatory bear um, incident and that's the one time that you probably not probably you do want to fight back is a predatory response because playing dead is not going to get the bear to go away because it thinks you're food so do everything you can in those scenarios where you, you realize that it's a predatory response, the bear's trying to eat you, uh, fight back in those scenarios. All right, so let's talk about if your de-escalation, uh, your de-escalation efforts failed, right? So we're going to have to defend ourselves at this point. So you have two options, bear spray or firearms. Uh, we're gonna talk about bear spray first. So when we go to use our bear spray, we need to realize that uh, we have a limited range, right? Uh, all the cans pretty much say um, 30 feet. So that's 10 yards. So 10 yards is nothing, right? Um, so that's the most we're gonna get out of our spray. And that's gonna be a little bit dependent on the wind, um, but generally, even with a strong wind, the, the, the spray will go out, it's just gonna come right back at you or go out and then get blown away, right? So when we go to use our bear spray, we need to realize that uh, a bear's head is not gonna be up, uh, up near our head. So if we go to spray and we are spraying like we're spraying a person, that cloud's gonna go right over the top of the bear. So what we wanna do is, is point it at the head and then as the bear's coming closer, that head's gonna get lower and lower and lower. So we need to spray and bring it down, okay? Uh, when we go to spray, we want to just spray and hold down the button until the bear changes its behavior or makes contact with you, okay? We're not gonna give little, ch -ch -ch. we're not gonna give little shots to try and save the can or anything like that. We're just going to hold down the can and spray until the bear changes its behavior um, or makes contact. We're also not gonna try and wave this around. Uh, and the reason being is we'll lose a little bit of the propagation and that makes the spray go a little farther. So what happens is some spray comes out and starts forming a cloud, some more comes behind it and pushes it a little farther, pushes it a little farther. So we don't want to do any zigzag or any of that pattern, so we just want to spray and keep spraying, just keep spraying, just keep spraying, okay? If you're going to carry bear spray, you need to learn how, you need to practice how to use it, right? It's not a natural shape or size of anything that we, we are pretty familiar with in our daily lives. So we really want to practice, A, getting it out of wherever we're going to carry it, and um, we want to carry it from our hips forward 
it's somewhere in the front half of our body, right? Under your bino harness, on your pack waist belt, but hips forward, okay? So you can instantly access it. And the other reason for that is if we don't have enough time to pull it out, we can still spray from here if it's in our, if it's in our, uh, on our hip belt here. But if it's back here, it's useless, right? It's much harder to get to. If it's hanging off your pack somewhere, it's completely useless. You might as not well carry it. Um, so somewhere from our hips forward on the front of our body, and we want to practice A, getting it out, and if we're gonna wear gloves or we're gonna have hiking poles or anything like that, we wanna practice clearing that stuff out of the way, uh, get this out, and, we want, and then we also need to practice getting the safety off. And I recommend everybody gets a can of the safety, uh, the, the trainer bear spray to practice this with. You can also use an empty can, uh, but there will be some residual in there, so that might be kind of fun. Um, so you can get these from UDAP and Frontiersman, I believe, um, counter salt has them as well, but I know those two companies have them for sure. And all this is is the propellant and some water. So you can practice spraying wherever and it's not going to have any effect on anything. Um, but we want to practice getting this safety off. And there's two basic methods that are here. We can either swipe it off with our thumb or we can kind of karate chop it backwards off with our other hand. That's your two basic methods. You want to practice that and practice, practice until you can't get that wrong, right? Same thing with our draw and then put that together, draw it, take it off, and then practice where we're gonna aim so we don't end up doing this, right? Um, so how the bear spray works is the, the spicy part of it needs to come in contact with the mucous membranes of the bear. So what mucous membranes, eyes, uh, mouth, nose, right? So we need to get the, the big cloud of spray right in the bear's face as much as possible for it to have the max effect. Um, let's talk about some of the pros of, of a bear spray, right? It's a non-lethal, uh, it's a non-lethal option, right? So non-lethal for the bear, non-lethal for us or our friends that we're hiking with. So when is this a good idea? Uh, if we're in a big group or we're, we're going with some inexperienced people, uh, as far as firearms or bear defense and that sort of thing go, even if they have a whoopsie with bear spray, they're probably not going to seriously injure or kill somebody. They're not going to kill somebody either. They're, they're not going to seriously injure somebody. And you don't have to unnecessarily um, kill a bear um, if you use bear spray, right? Um, it's, uh, it's lightweight. It's probably a full can of bear spray is probably about a third of the weight of a, a, a fully loaded firearm. So if you're just trying to save some weight, you can, uh, you can save some weight there. Um, if you're going to carry bear spray, I highly recommend carrying two cans, right? We talked about using the can and just spraying, right? Um, so that might not be enough. So I always recommend carrying two cans just because you only get about seven to nine seconds uh, per can. That's not a lot of time. So if you're, if you're choosing bear spray only, carry two cans. Um, if you do end up having to spray a bear, there's not gonna be any paperwork uh, investigation or anything like that. You still need to notify, if you have an incident with a bear, notify the, uh, the game department in your area uh, when and where and, and why all that stuff that happened. Um, but there's not gonna be a big investigation of paperwork and stuff like if you ended up having to shoot a bear, right? Um, some of the cons of the bear spray is a close range, right? Um, so if we're getting max 10 yards out of this can, that means we have to wait until the bear's close enough so we don't spray and the cloud dissipates before the bear comes through the cloud, right? So we probably have to wait till the bear's 25, 20 yards before we start spraying, and um, that's pretty dang close. <laughs> so you don't get a lot of range out of it. Um, when you use bear spray, if you've never messed around with a can of bear spray, it doesn't matter which way the wind's blowing, you're gonna get a little bit on you. So be prepared for that. Um, if you have an old expired can, you can, you can spray it in a trash can or something and get a little whiff of it so you know what it's gonna be like. Um, but it, when you use bear spray, uh, there's going to be a little bit that sputters out of the nozzle. Uh, the wind can blow back on you. Almost every time I've ever messed with it, I've gotten a little bit on me. So just be aware of that. Um, the limited quantity, like we talked about, so that's why we carry two cans. Um, it's a bit awkward, like I said, as far as it's not a normal shape or, or type of object we use. So we need to practice with it. Um, it can be um, an attractant after the fact. Uh, for other bears or if you accidentally discharge the can or something. Um, for whatever reason, I think the oil in it is, is uh, an attractant for the bears. So they've, they've documented um, bears coming and checking out an area that's been bear sprayed. 
So keep that in mind. If you do have to use it, uh, it's, you need to treat it just like, uh, just like any other food attractant and get out of that area. Um, there's also a pretty short term effect on the bear. So they're gonna, they're gonna, you know, if you get a bear full face, they're gonna have an effect. It's, they're gonna cough and they're gonna irritate eyes and all that. It's probably gonna um, solve your problem, but it, it's pretty temporary. You're gonna get a few minutes, maybe 20 minutes, uh, and then the effects are gonna wear off. And if you're still in that area, you can have problems with the bears. And there's, there's some documented cases of that as well. Okay, so let's talk about firearms and uh, defending yourself against bears. Uh, one, of the, one of the uses is we can, we can use it for a warning shot, uh, get a little more distance, right? A little uh, safety buffer. So um, when you do a warning shot, you need to really watch where you're aiming and watch that spot until you pull the trigger. Um, and you don't want to shoot in front of the bear in case it ricochets, and you and you don't want to shoot into any rocky areas for the same reason, right? We don't want to injure the bear and possibly cause a uh, an attack when there wasn't going to be one. Um, so when you're doing your warning shot. Um, you, you want to get it close to the bear, but not so close that uh, you might accidentally shoot him. And like I said, uh, watch that spot until the, the, the shot breaks, and here's why. I was up hunting in Alaska a few years back, bow hunting uh, deer, called in a big old bear uh, instead of a deer, and um, hey, let, it, let you know, did the hay, you know, were people here. Uh, he decided he was going to come check us out, come around this pond, and if he would have come around he would have trapped us. So we start backing out of this area and he gets to where we were, sniff around and then turns and comes towards us. Now behind us is some pretty thick brush uh, to the road. So I really don't want the bear following us into there. So I'm like, okay, time for a warning shot. I aim about five feet off to the side of this bear and start squeezing. But I look back at the bear and my hands drifts over. And as I break the shot, uh, I realize that I'm about to shoot this bear. And luckily it missed just barely its foot. Um, and I didn't shoot the bear, but that, that tells you that you really need to watch where that shot's going to go until, it, until you fire the shot and then look back at the bear, right? Um, so let's say the warning shot doesn't work or we don't have time for a warning shot or whatever. We need to shoot this bear. It's, it's coming at us, right? Um, where are we going to shoot? Um, I like to tell people from the nose down to mid chest in kind of a U shape, right? We can start breaking down shoulders, right? Immobilize them a little bit. Um, we can get in the sternum and start getting into the chest cavity, uh, the vital organs, and we can get nose and mouth um, or eyes too um, and start, uh, start having an effect on that bear. Get as many shots as we can on that bear in that zone and hopefully that buys us more time to get better shots on, right? Uh, these shots are going to be fast and might not be all that accurate. So if we can break the bear, bear down a little bit and get more accurate shots on it with a little more time, that's going to be ideal. Um, I will tell you that if you start shooting the bear, you had better, you'd probably better just um, shoot the bear until it's dead uh, because there's going to be an investigation, right? And we don't want to be sending, um, we don't want to be sending our, our uh, uh, fishing game department or whoever's going to investigate in to investigate a wounded bear. That'd be really dangerous for them. So if we have to start shooting the bear, it's going to be best if we kill the bear. Um, I do not recommend headshots for the most part, and here's why. This is, this is a black bear skull, and it's a pretty big black bear skull, and I don't know, a big brown bear skull is probably going to be twice the size, but you'll get the general idea. Um, this right here is a super thick plate um, of bone, and it is uh, pretty sloped, right? So if we are shooting, um, we're shooting here, the, the chance of a ricochet off that part is, it could happen. Um, if you're using a hard cast bullet, it, it's probably going to punch through, but it could ricochet off. But here's the thing, um, the, the, the skull or the, the brain cavity is up here, right? So all the brain is above here and clear in the back. So even if we're shooting here, right, the bear's head's down low and we're shooting from up here and we're shooting down, that trajectory is taking it down out the bottom of the head and not even contacting the brain or the parts that we need to to shut the bear off. Um, we can start having an effect on the bear and possibly turn the bear from attack or dissuade it from attacking, uh, but it's probably not going to be fatal shooting it in this area where you would think. Now, if we, you know, if we can get shots on the side of the bear, um, 
we want to realize that the brain is clear back here, okay? This is kind of the, the front line of this brain. You can see this ridge. So all the brain is clear back here. Um, same thing with nose or mouth shots. They're probably going to go completely underneath of the brain cavity because the bear's head's going to be down as it's charging you. Um, so you're probably not hitting, hitting what you think you are when you're shooting a bear in the head. Uh, so, that, so I don't recommend the head shots on a bear. Here down in a U shape, you know, into the, into the um, center mass, into the vital organs, break shoulders, you know, break nose, mouth, have an effect on the bear. Um, but we're probably not getting a brain shot on the bear. Um, so let's talk about the pros of the firearm. Uh, we talked about warning, the ability to have a warning shot a little more distance, right? We can start engaging a bear a little bit farther away. Um, but we can't start shooting at a bear, say it's at 50 yards and it's being wonky and acting aggressive. We can't start shooting it then. Um, we need to be sure that it is going to charge us, right, or attack us. Um, and that's going to keep us out of trouble and, and uh, as far as um, taking the life of the bear, of course, out of season or out of tag or whatever. Um, and the thing that'll keep you out of trouble is knowing all these warning signs and knowing the aggressive signs and being able to say, hey, uh, this bear, I saw it at this range, it started acting aggressive. I tried to de-escalate by doing this, this, and this. It didn't work. He charged me, then I shot it. You know, and, and there's no magic line in the sand. It, ha you know, it has to be less than 10 yards, it has to be less than 30 yards, whatever. But it probably has to be less than 30. It, you know, in that 10 to 30 range is probably where you're gonna be fine. As long as you can say, hey, uh, I did these things, the bear did these things, it attacked, uh, and then I felt like it was going to get me, so I shot it, right? Being able to articulate that and show that you were not just shooting at the bear because you were scared uh, is, gonna what's, it's, is what's going to keep you out of hot water, right? We don't want to be unnecessarily shooting bears if we don't have to. Um, so, you know, keep those things in mind and don't start shooting a bear at 50 yards because you're going to get in trouble. Um, we can use a firearm for a couple of other things other than just bear defense, right? If we're in a um, if we're in a rescue situation, we need to get rescued. We can use the uh, firearm as a warning or a uh, a signal, an audible signal. Uh, you know, search and rescue's out looking for you, and they hear a gunshot, they're going to come investigate that. Uh, you know, or your friends are out and. You're hunting, you know, you're hunting separate from your friends and you're archery hunting and you hear a gunshot. That's probably a sign that something's awry. You can you know, go check on your friend, that sort of thing. Um, we can use it for warning shot. We can also use it in a, you know, a rescue scenario. Um, we can use it to gather some food if we need to. Some of the cons of a firearm, uh, it is a lethal weapon, right? So you have the, you have the um, chance of killing the bear. Uh, you know, if, it, if we have to, we have to. We don't really want to, but if we have to, we have to. But we can also injure or kill our friends if we are in a group hunting and we have to start using firearms. Uh, the possibility of shooting one another is, is, is much higher than, say, uh, you know, a bear spray and we just get a wash our face out or whatever. You know, patching a, patching a bullet wound is a little more serious than that. So the serious consequences uh, are a little higher than the bear spray. And then... Um, it's, it requires a lot more training to be proficient with a firearm. Learning the draw, learning the weapon manipulation, getting fast and accurate with that firearm, because you're shooting a tiny little bullet at a moving target. Um, so you gotta get pretty dang good at that and train your body to react to the warnings, um, to the, uh, you know, the warning signs of bear, bear charging through the brush or whatever. So, so it's an instant natural reaction. Same thing with the bear spray. It needs to be an instant natural reaction. So we need to train with our tools um, to be very proficient with them if we're gonna trust our lives to them. Um, when we're carrying our firearm, same thing with the bear spray, we wanna carry it uh, from the hips forward if it's on our pack. Uh, and I, I much prefer a chest rig of some sort um, just because it can stay on you if you drop your pack or you're, you're taking a break or whatever. And I also keep mine on when I'm quartering my animal. So I prefer a chest rig. Uh, pack mount holster works as well, especially if you can take it off and stick it on your belt. All right, let's talk about uh, firearm selection. Here's what I tell people. Uh, choose a gun that you can be fast and accurate with and choose a gun that you'll carry every time. 
Uh, if that is a 44 or a bigger revolver, fine. If you're going to practice and be fast and accurate with that gun, and you can control the recoil and get follow-up shots on, on target effectively uh, with a large revolver, go for it, right? I'm not going to talk you out of more power. Realize that that's going to be a heavier gun and realize you're going to have less ammo. So if you, your first few shots aren't effective, uh, you're going to have a much limited, much smaller supply of ammo uh, going forward if you, you still have a problem. Um, if a nine millimeter is all you can handle accurately and fast, you can choose some solids in that. And I, I know several, uh, two people, I know at least two people that have successfully stopped bear attacks with a nine mil. And if you look at the studies and all the numbers of people that have successfully stopped bear attacks, nine millimeters is actually pretty dang high on the list. Um, that's not because it's the best choice. It's not because, you know, it's this, you know, it's the ideal choice for bear defense. I think most of that is because a lot of people conceal carry or uh, everyday carry their nine mil and then not for bears, you know, for people and everything, but then end up in a scenario where they encounter bear and have to use that. So I think that's probably why that number is so high and not just because people pick nine mil because uh, let's face it, it, for a large bear, it's probably underpowered, but it can get the job done if you are fast and accurate with it and you can get the shots in the zone that matters. Uh, that's much easier with a nine mil. So there is some merit to that. I will tell you that 40 and 45, uh, of all the concealed carry cartridges or the, or the normal carry cartridges, I would pick nine mil over 40 and 45. Uh, nine millimeter gets better penetration than both of those, uh, the, both of those rounds do. Um, and then the next important thing is your, is your bullet selection, right? And what I'm talking about is the projectile portion of the, of the round here. And what we want to look for in a bear defense or a dangerous game defense type round is a solid, uh, a solid round. And by solid, I mean, um, hard, hard material that's going to penetrate very deeply, right? Um, hard cast lead, machined, um, uh, machined copper, machine brass, that sort of thing. Um, those are the rounds we're going to look for. Uh, we do not want to use our normal everyday carry hollow points. Those are designed to not over, over penetrate a human being. So they are, they're going to be not very effective on a uh, large bear with heavy, heavy hide, heavy fur, heavy bone, right? Um, there was an incident last year in Wyoming where a guy used a 45 with hollow points and emptied a lot of rounds into a bear and it was not effective. Um, the, the guide actually um, had uh, solids out of 10 mil and, and his shots were effective full pass-throughs on most of his shots. So uh, your bullet selection is going to be important. We want to use a solid, so that's a hard cast lead or a machined bullet. We don't want to use hollow points, our normal hollow points for self-defense, and we don't want to use our typical range ammo or ball ammo, you might know it as, because all that is is soft lead with a thin copper jacket over it, and that will just act a lot like a uh, hollow point. It'll mushroom up and, and it won't penetrate as deeply as the other two harder bullets will. All right, so let's talk about if those two methods fail. Uh, your, bear, your bear spray doesn't, uh, doesn't make it happen, your gun doesn't make it happen. Uh, the, the bear's contacting you, right? You're, you are being attacked. What we want to do in everything but a, but a predatory attack is play dead. So what that means is we're going to lay on the ground and we're going to play dead. But we want to do a couple things while we're doing that, right? We need to protect our neck. That's a very sensitive, delicate area, right? We got the carotid and we have our spine, right? So um, we need to protect our neck. How we can do that, we can shrug our shoulders up. If we still have our pack on, we can tuck our head back in behind our pack, right? But the, the shoulder shrug will get most of your, most of your neck protected. And then we want to bring our hands up and uh, maybe interlace them or hold them up here. Um, and we want to protect, um, as much of our head and, and neck as possible. A bear's mouth is not big enough to actually bite on both sides of your skull enough to crush it, but you'll get a lot of uh, tearing and grinding and stuff uh, on your scalp. Um, and then we want to protect our vital organs, the soft part that's not uh, protected by ribs, right? So we want to hunch over um, on the ground, curl up, tighten that up, uh, protect that as much as possible, protect our neck and head as much as possible. Um, the legs, it's kind of a toss up. 
Um, some people say keep your legs out and spread to help keep from rolling over. Um, and some people are, are of, the, of the thought that you should tuck your legs up, up under yourself and protect them because you might need them to carry you out of the situation uh, once the attack's over. I don't really have a strong opinion either way on that one. Um, that's probably going to be very situation dependent. Is the bear paying your legs any attention? If not, leave them out. Uh, maybe tuck them in if they are pay if he is if he or she is paying attention to the to the legs. I don't know. You'll have to play that one by ear. But the big piece of this um, to minimize the attack is to be as still as possible and to be as quiet as possible. Um, talking to uh, talking to a guy that survived a bear attack. Um, and, and reading other stories and, and hearing other stories of other bear attacks, when people would make noise or would try and move, um, you know, if the bear would stop attacking for a second or something, or during the attack, it would just reinvigorate the attack and make the bear bite and, and scratch and stomp harder and faster. So when you're playing dead, you need to be still, be quiet, and just be a lump on the ground, basically, while you're protecting as much as you can protect. Um, and then once the attack is over, and the, the, let the bear get away from you for a good bit of time before you look. You know, if you can peek a look, tiny look maybe, but um, uh, many, many, many stories you read, the people started moving too early and it, the, the bear came back and re-attacked. So um, play completely dead, let the bear go away. Uh, you know, cautiously get up, look around, and then get the heck out of that area uh, if the bear does contact you. The caveat to that is a predatory attack, right? If the bear is trying to flip you over and get at your guts, right? That's how they generally will start eating animals that they catch. They'll just flip them over and start and start tearing at their abdomen. If the bear is doing that, or it just seems like he's trying, he's probably going to eat you and not just beating the crap out of you. Um, we want to fight back with everything we can. Uh, smack it in the face with a rock, a stick, trek and pull. Smash it in the face with a bag. Uh, I have read two stories of guys successfully uh, deterring the attacks by sticking their whole hand down the bear's throat and like grabbing the back of their tongue and stuff. Of course, their arm gets shredded, but for whatever reason, that, that has worked twice for two different people. So uh, if it's a predatory attack, do whatever you can uh, to fight back um, and hopefully make the bear think this isn't worth it. I'm going to go find something else. So one more thing on the predatory attacks, uh, a lot of them are attributed or tied to um, people habituated bears. So, you know, like bears in natural, national parks and stuff that are used to finding people's garbage. Uh, it used to be a much bigger problem when the dumps and stuff were open, but um, it, you know, dirty camps or, you know, people that are sloppy with camps and bears are getting into people's garbage. Um, that can bring bears in at night and then bear gets curious and or you might have food in your tent or something. Um, the predatory response of a bear coming into your tent is uh, a bear coming into your tent. You can just basically um, treat that as predatory. OK, so in those instances, you want to fight back with everything you can. Um, depending on the situation and how you camped, you know, you can you can fire a warning shot through your tent if you have to. Um, but you know, yell at the bear, fight back if it's coming into your tent. Um, just consider a bear coming into your camp at night uh, as a predatory event. All right, so to wrap this up, let's talk a little bit about complacency. And what I mean by that is kind of dropping your guard or getting used to being out and um, not being as aware of, of possible bear incidents. Right. Um, so in the in the military, we had a saying complacency kills and it's the same thing in the bear woods. And what I really mean by this is kind of the same way as a, as playing poker. Right. Uh, how hard is it or how rare is it to get a royal flush in poker? Pretty darn hard. The odds of having a bear attack are probably pretty similar. Right. But here's the thing. If we play enough hands of poker over our lifetime, we will probably draw a royal flush at some point. Same thing with bear attack. If we have enough incidents or not incidents, if we have enough trips out in bear country, uh, you know, eventually at some point we're going to have a, an incident. Hopefully it's not bad, but we're probably going to have one if we keep going out and out and out. Right. And the way we, our brain normally thinks of this is I go into this area four, five, six, seven times. I don't have an incident. I'm good, man. I can relax. It's all, it's all fine. But the way we need to think about it is every time we go out and we don't have, we don't draw that row of flush. We don't have that bear incident. We're one chance closer to having it. 
So we need to, that, that's how we kind of trick our brain into always staying aware, is we tell ourselves, hey, I didn't have an incident last time, uh, my chance might be this time, we might, we might draw that row of flush this time. So uh, don't let yourself get complacent, um, you know, with your awareness, with your training, you know, making sure your equipment's in good order, all those things. Um, just keep yourself aware and keep yourself safe in bear country. If you have any follow-on questions, uh, you, can, you can reach out to me on social media. I'm at Razco Gear, R-A-Z-C-O Gear, uh, on both Instagram and Facebook. You can message me there. Um, and if you found some value in this, please share it with somebody else that uh, you think could use this information.